In 1969, a group of astronauts changed the world. They walked on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1972, our journey ended. We've never been back. 2010 begins a year of change. Private companies are working on next generation spaceships. Governments are looking to go back to the moon and on to Mars. It's time to look up and dream again. It's time to push humans into the cosmos. It's time to educate and engage the planet. It's time for Space Vidcast. This is Space Vidcast 3.33 for Friday, October 8th, 2010. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham will be your hosts for this evening. And what an evening we have got. Let me think. We uh, missed last week's show, and during that time, uh, basically, we found a planet that's an uh, Earth-like planet, we you think. You know, we should miss more shows. Uh, yeah, I mean, just, you know, major scientific discoveries. Uh, and for this week, actually, it's the anniversary of Elcross. It feels like it just happened last month. For those who don't remember, that was the mission where we bombed the moon. Okay, well, whatever. That's, that's at least that's how the media media had it coming out. And we are joined on both coasts by some of the Elcross team. Uh, we're joined both on the west coast by... Oh, I actually closed that. <laughs> really? <laughs> I was like, be prepared for this. I know. Get ready I'm to go. I'm so sorry. We're joined on the East Coast by Emery Stagmer. Hopefully, I, I still pronounce that correctly. And on the West Coast by. <laughs> We've got Jim Munger, Craig Elder, and Jose Cabanas. And, and Vax, just to help us out, repasted it uh, in, my, in my iPad. Hey, guys, welcome, very, uh, welcome to Space Vidcast. Thank you for joining us. Glad to be hey, here. So uh, let's start off with, for those who don't remember, what was uh, LRO and what was LCROSS? What was that mission a year ago? Uh, let's start with uh, the hardware guys on the West Coast. All right, I'm Craig Elder. I was the electrical lead during the design and development process. Uh, the LRO spacecraft, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, was the moon's version of Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, intended to map out lunar resources in many different spectra. Uh, laser altimeter, surface penetrating radar, optical camera, all sorts of good stuff. Trouble was, it was a little too big for its initial rocket. When it switched to the next biggest rocket, the Atlas V, uh, there was an extra 1,000 kilograms of throw weight headed towards the moon. Hence was born Elcross back in January, February of 2006. Uh, shall I keep going, Ben? Oh, ben? yeah, no, keep going. I mean, we're just, we're, we're all about, you know, all about you guys. All right, well, uh, not to bore your audience, but the proposal was actually pretty entertaining. There were 19 different uh, teams, government industry teams, competing for this one slot, how to use the 1,000 kilograms headed to the moon. Uh, there were little uh, rovers. There were some guys in Texas, I think, had a, a drill that would try to drill down through to try to find water. Along comes the NASA Ames Northrop Grumman team, and we decided to cheat. We said... Uh, Gee, in addition to the 1,000 kilograms that we want, there's this 2,000 kilogram Centaur upper stage rocket that's just going to be space junk if we don't do something with it. How about we use that as a kinetic impactor? Turned out to be a, ooh, Jose has the paper version. <laughs> and props. We have props. <laughs> yeah, we have this model is actually more important than you realize. Yeah, we'll get into the importance of that in a little bit. This part right here is the stage, and this part right here is the L-Cross. Part of the magic of uh, the business L-Cross beating out the other 18 candidates was that we figured out a way not only to cheat on the mass that we were carrying, but we also figured out that we could turn a piece of the Centaur's uh, auxiliary structure, the secondary payload adapter ring, we figured out that we could turn that into a free-flying camera platform. Not only 
uh, to guide the spacecraft into the Cabeus Crater, but also then to observe uh, the impact and, and then create a second crater up there. And you, you guys were pretty much looking for water, correct? Yes. Oh, very much so. Actually, ice, because at 395 degrees Fahrenheit below zero, it's not really water at that point. <laughs> Fair enough. We, we were going to a place where there are places on the north and south pole of the moon that never get sunlight in the craters. And that's where they had these, uh, these radar signatures that looked kind of like ice. And that's where they wanted to go and drop something in there and see what they could bring up. And talk to me about impact day, because you, you guys, you go there and then there was a stage step uh, and you send down, um, um, you send down the impactor first, right? Because you're, you're blowing a crater in the moon and then you're, you're getting all the, the ejections going and then you're sending L cross down after it to get the readings, right? Right. So how did that all go? Um, actually, it went exactly as planned. Uh, the, um, the stage itself uh, separated the, See where is it? That part of it right there. The stage <laughs> itself separated um, just perfectly, and uh, after it happened, they turned the cameras on on the spacecraft and swung the spacecraft around. And all of a sudden, on the TV screens that are beaming beam down from orbit, you're seeing this little image of the rocket stage drifting away. And if you look real closely at it, you can see in the shadows, you know, various things that had been troubling us, like the batteries that had sprayed on us and all sorts of other stuff like that, which was really uh, just fascinating and absolutely wonderful because that was the one thing that we couldn't rehearse and the one thing we couldn't plan for. And it was the one thing that had to work or else we were going to have to go to the backup plan real quick, which didn't involve us doing much of anything at past that point. Wait, 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 what was the back? You had a backup plan? How do you have a backup plan to, to you know, impacting the moon? The backup plan is don't hit the moon? What? No, actually, the, ba the backup plan is the spacecraft just uh, carries the stage and crashes along with it, and, and you have to kind of look at it from other things. You can't get the real good close-up pictures that we got. Our success criteria was crashing into the moon and yeah. discovering water, not necessarily taking the pictures ourselves. So well, you set your bar really low, right? What are we going to do? What? We're going to crash into the moon. That's pretty easy. We don't oh, need no, to no, 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 no. That it's, was the minimum set. It's better than that because the way that they structured the, the mission, the whole idea was that it was supposed to be cheap enough that it could fail. And we had to, we, as we got further into it, we were kind of saying, you know, that really is not a good guiding theory for how you're going to build and fly the spacecraft. So we, 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 had we started taking it a lot more way. serious as time went on. We were Class D when we started out, and then we weren't Class D anymore by the time we started getting close to the moon. Yeah. I'm going to pop over to um, uh, the East Coast for a second and talk to Emery, because Emery, you've talked to us about this before, about the different classifications of missions and what they mean and how L Cross was classified. Can you uh, 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 kind of recap what all that means and why it was important? Yeah, the, um, Class D essentially means that there's a significant possibility that you will not be able to meet your mission criteria. Uh, but because it's uh, risky and uh, worthwhile doing, uh, you might want to go ahead and take the risk and try and do it anyhow. Uh, so this was about as low cost a mission as you can do and actually fly a satellite. So uh, NASA said, uh, we're going to take that risk. We're going to go ahead and try and do it. Awesome. And uh, it was with very low expectations, well, yeah, which I, I do still think is funny because I, I realize it's very uh, hard. This is rocket science, but you're know, like, eh, crash that thing into the moon. Oh, that's not going to work. No, but do, <laughs> it, do it anyway. Go ahead and try. I do it in 24 months. And uh... it, it, it's better than that, because as time went on, when we first started this mission, there were a, a, a number of folks that we talked to in NASA who said it won't work. And as time went on, um, there was there was a, a piece of the project that we had, which was dedicated to having a set of just aluminum boxes full of sand available to bolt on in place of the electronics if we couldn't make the schedule. And so we went all the way down to the point where we just were about ready to go into the environmental test chambers before they finally canceled that because there was a there was concerns on the part of everybody and, and we weren't immune to it. We had we had a certain amount of fear ourselves as time went on that this was very aggressive scheduling and this was a very aggressive program and you know the opportunity was there for us to fail at many points along the way. It's like a double a, dog dare. Like, 
Yeah. You know, let, let's go back a little ways because this was not a flawless mission. It's not like you launched and you just made it there and everything went as planned. There were a few uh, hurdles along the way. Can you describe a few of those? Sure. Okay, here's our, here's our spacecraft. And our, our first problem, hold it up to the camera here. Higher, higher, higher. 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 Our high, these, this is, by the way, for everyone watching, this is highly technical CGI. It is. Right this, now. Very expensive animation. Actually, Use this model, okay? So we had problems with the thrusters, mm -hmm. okay? And um, they were running cold. The thermostats weren't turning on and weren't keeping them warm. So we figured, okay, how do we get these warm? So I picked up the model, literally started looking at it. And I go, you know, if I tilt it toward the sun, I can get sun on the thrusters back there, and we can keep the thrusters warm. And uh, that's where we started. And once we figured that out, we got the mass properties guys, and we got the, all the designers in there, and had them do CAD pictures, and started the real technical ball rolling. Okay, and um, slowly but surely, we had to slowly work and violate a bunch of uh, limitations and constraints until we understood the thermal. But we started with the cardboard model, and figuring out that we could roll it into the sun. So that was the first hurdle. Is that the actual model you looked at when you were trying to figure it out? Uh, this one was my personal model. Uh, the model itself was uh, goes back to our space park days when we knew that all of our great spacecraft had a paper model that the public could uh, punch out and glue together. <laughs> uh, it was after midnight. Our mechanical lead, Dean Daly, and I were uh, sitting around thinking, man, we really should come up with a model. So we figured out a little uh, PowerPoint, uh, drew some cylinders and squares and cut it out. And Soon that PowerPoint started being distributed. Before too long, uh, we figured we could add another page uh, rolled up in a cylinder. That could be the Centaur. And in about a week, we were distributing yeah. PowerPoint versions. Oh, it only took you like about eight or 12 hours to cut out and glue together. Our art department at Northrop got a hold of it and uh, did a uh, pre cut, die cast, you know, pre folded. Sh now, shiny paper. Shiny paper. And now, uh, <laughs> Any second grader can put about three quarters of it together in an hour, and you need a PhD in astrophysics to get the the uh, final part done. <laughs> I love only okay, I, I hours. Yeah, there there are a lot of these things sitting in bookcases all over Southern California that have never been cut out and yeah, they're, they're just flat. <laughs> they just look like. It. Oh, now I totally want to find sure. one. Well, that and you probably could have even uh, made it out of Legos with that amount of time and effort put into it. <laughs> I actually talked to somebody about getting a Lego kit of the spacecraft that and just having so cool. like a bag so you could put it together, but it just cost too much. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. actually, Aww. it would be brilliant because what's the what's the best part of Legos? You get the Legos, then all you have to do is when you're done with it, you throw it at a wall. <laughs> and be like, it's like the real thing. <laughs> 5,600 miles per hour. <laughs> but they, they were experimenting with other L-Cross toys, and, I, and one of my favorites was, uh, I don't know if Craig has it, but... Um, we were shooting a big, big little Nerf um, projectile that kind of looked like Elcross at a target. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, a glass wall in our in our bay where we put oh, that's right. we uh, had the craters of the moon, the crater of the moon map yeah. up, and people could come in with a with a with like a, a suction cup gun and now, pick uh, out which crater they wanted to shoot at and see if they could hit it. Now we looked at this as a mission simulation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I love it. <laughs> I, now, I you can that. get your own set, but the darts are only $79 million a piece. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was oh, your first cool. challenge. Uh, you, you, the what? thrusters were getting too cold, then what? <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead. Um, we had other fun anomalies um, where the... Centaur leak? Yeah, so, okay. the, so, the, so the Centaur wasn't quite empty, okay? So the rocket down here had stuff left over in it, okay? So down around here somewhere... I can hold it up high enough. Uh, we had these, these um, valves that would spew out stuff every once in a while because it um, had fuel in it. The spacecraft would literally burp. So I'd be watching the, the terminal. All of a sudden, the rates would just go nuts, and I had all this gyration going on. And, and we looked at it for a bit, and, oh, it was a burp. <laughs> so, you know, and, and the burps um, on occasion weren't bad, but um, we noticed that it was kind of spewing on a regular basis and putting just a little bit of torque into the spacecraft all the time. So we had to had to adjust the, the ACS um, modes to take care of that. 
So it's not a term that I normally hear rocket scientists using. What's wrong with the rocket? It's burping. I don't know. It, just, it has gas. I can't. Gas. I can't. Yeah, oh, it, 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 I had it was, kids. It was, it was the deal. It was burping and it was spewing. At, <laughs> at, at, uh, just had bad indigestion. Uh, it was. It was. It was causing us indigestion. I'll say that. <laughs> Were there oh, any yeah. other MacGyver moments that you guys had where you're just like, how are we, all right, we've got a rubber band, a piece of tape, and a stick. How can we use these to fix, you know, this and make the, make the mission still a success? When we, when, we, when we lost our fuel, we pulled out the rubber bands and the sticks and the, yeah. tried to put things together, and we managed to do that. That was plan C. <laughs> and the, but you guys did, right? I mean, yep. the mission was a success. You slammed into the moon. Uh, but I, I, I'm going to give you one, one little gripe, and that was the beautiful CGI animations that we saw from multiple cameras, which, you know, I, I don't know where these cameras were going to be. On the, they look like that, right? Where you've got, like, the moon and this 500-mile thing of water oh, coming up. Oh, I have up. seen that one. That's cool. Can I give <laughs> <Isn't that neat? laughs> So there was this great, like, you know, you, you hit it with the, the second stage, and then it came up, and there was just, and then we're watching it live, and we're all like, all right, impact. Well, and I think well, somewhere along the line, somebody the said video. something, you'd be able to see the impact from Earth with, uh, with a relatively low-grade binoculars or something along the And we could even see it, like, from space. I'll take this one, if I may. Yeah, <laughs> knock Please. yourself out. Uh, keep in mind that uh, we did deliver 7.2 gigajoules of kinetic energy into an area the size of your dining room. And uh, that is a phenomenal amount of energy. And... Uh, it did create, if you were standing anywhere nearby, you would have seen a plume that looked a lot like the video in shape and intensity. However, it was three kilometers down below the rim of a very steep crater wall. Very steep, dark yeah. crater wall. We, About two weeks before impact, we had a, our project scientists had a, had a dilemma they had to resolve, which was do we go for an impact in Cabeus A which has very low rims and would be a spectacular view from Earth? Or do we switch to a place that is more likely to contain uh, the frozen ice that we're looking to find, which was Cabeus proper? And I, for one, believe that uh, the science team made the right decision. Well, the, the other thing is that as time went on, um, they were looking at data that was coming down from LRO and coming down from uh, the the Japanese and the Indian spacecraft, um, and I don't know if they had any Changi data from the Chinese or not, but but they constantly were getting updated information, and especially as LRO had been up there and flying, they went through a, a very short activation cycle to get their instruments online before they had a chance to do all their full calibrations to be able to say, this is a good place to crash L-Cross into the moon. And so those decisions were, were, were driving them in terms of the science, and, and what happened at the end was, like Craig said, the science overcame the video. And so we ended up dropping this thing down in a hole, and not as much stuff came up above the crater rim to be illuminated by the sun as they originally thought it was going to. But lots and lots of water, as I understand it. I mean, it's, it was, there was the press briefing after where they made the big dramatic thing with the things of water. Buckets and, yeah. yeah. It, it, it was wetter where we landed in the crater than it is on some places of the surface of the Earth. That's cool. Let's pop back over to the East Coast for a moment because I've been ignoring Emery. And, um, you know, I'm like that because I'm like, ah, we know Vax. Yeah. Uh, but Vax, tell us about uh, some of the, the fun stuff that happened on the software side during the mission. Did you have any challenges uh, during the L-Cross mission itself? Uh, we had a couple. Um, they, uh, they did a lot of changes to... Um, some of the onboard parameters and so there was a lot of back and forth on trying to get um, new information uploaded to the spacecraft there was a lot of challenges in that um, especially after we had the uh, propellant loss in uh, August uh, the RACS guys had to attitude control software guys had to uh, figure out essentially a whole new way to fly the spacecraft and they did it in what Craig like two weeks uh, it was a really phenomenally short period of time uh, and they basically the rolled. And, and the first patch is done in like a day, and then yeah, it was amazing. They they fixed. They basically, you know, changed all the configurations on how the entire spacecraft was flown, and by the time we were done, it was actually more efficient um, in the worst case than it was in the best case beforehand. So it was pretty amazing. 
teaspoons of fuel a day at the end. Right. <laughs> and and that was, part of that was driven by the fact that we didn't have a lot of money and we didn't have a lot of time. So before launch, we took a look at what we had to do in terms of how much fuel was on board the spacecraft. And we really designed the thing to sort of a minimum level of performance to be able to make sure that we crashed into the moon. And that worked real fine until we almost ran out of gas and then we had to get a little more creative. Now, you're kind of a skunk works project. You're just kind of a, I don't want to say under the radar, but certainly a, hey, we want to do payload too. We can do this cool stuff. And I got to believe it's a smaller group. I mean, it was, I, we were talking in pre-show, it was no more than about 100 people on the whole program. Is that correct? It's actually the peak. The uh, average was 46 heads for the, the three years of the program. And the core team, like uh, once we delivered the spacecraft to NASA and got into mission operations, and we, we had uh, well, yeah, 15 of technical heads at Northrop and about the same number of, same number at NASA. About the same. Yeah, about the same. We had, <laughs> and we had one at Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> one of our engineers went off to, to, to get his graduate degree, and because of the delays in the launch, the two lined up on top of each other. So he'd go to class, then he'd drive down to Ames Research Center from Berkeley and sit on console for a shift during a contact, and he'd go back up and take his classes again. Well, it's even better than that. He was, we had an anomaly, and he's in class. Okay, so I'm texting him while he's in class saying, Matt, what do we do here? You know, and I'm, and I'm sending him little pictures and stuff, and he's texting me back in class. You need to do this, and you need to do that, and you need to do that. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Wouldn't be awesome now, we if the teachers... Cool. Matt, though, uh, we had fun with Matt. <laughs> Jim, Wouldn't be Jim awesome if the teacher stopped uh, him and was like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm sorry. We're sending something to the moon, and I just need to... I just yeah, get, hang on, hang on a second. I'm working with some stuff no on the moon. I'll, I'll be right back. Man. I just need yeah. to. <laughs> he just had his computer open like he was typing away, and, and he did it. We were we weren't always nice to Matt though because um, I um, was the leader of the mission ops organization, and I made sure to feed my people really well. And the NASA people didn't catch on to that early on. Um, they they managed to change, so they were making sure if the people had to be there 24 seven, they were feeding them. Um, well, while they were in the in the um, operations room, so when Matt transitioned to Berkeley and then he was going to NASA, well, at that time they weren't feeding them very well. So um, Matt was a real stickler for bacon and eggs, right? <laughs> so we took a picture of the bacon and eggs tray from the cafeteria, and we would fax that to him every about every 15 minutes. <laughs> or she'd text it to him every 15 minutes, so it kept popping up on his display. Oh, my God, I have one other Berkeley uh, story. That the day of the anomaly, we were having trouble getting a hold of Matt because it was about 5 in the morning. And uh, <laughs> my, son is a, my son's a sophomore up at Berkeley, and I called my son, get him out of bed, and say, ride your bike over to Matt's house. Get him on the line. And uh, sure enough, we got Matt oh, by about, what, 8, 8.30? Yeah, he, he came online right after I got in. They call, they, call, they call me at home, and um, my cell phone went off in the other room, and, and my, I woke up after, about a half an hour later, and my wife said, oh, your cell phone went off. So I went in, I went in and picked it up, and I, and I dial in, it's Craig, and, and I, I call Craig, and Craig says, um, we had an anomaly, and we almost ran out of fuel. And I, I was thinking to myself, because we're getting close to the impact and close to the critical time of flight, that this is one of those tests. And I said, was this a test? No, this no. is not a test. <laughs> The next thing I know, I'm jumping in and some clothes and heading for work. During the anomaly, I'm the, I was the lead um, systems engineer, uh, the lead uh, technical specialist for the spacecraft. And uh, Eric, who's not unfortunately here tonight, was my second. So um, between the two of us, one was on shift all the time. And um, Eric went um, camping. And uh, all of a sudden, we have this anomaly. And Eric is nowhere to be found. We texted him. We you know, called his phone. So for days, you know, he, he, he is unavailable. So I'm like living there during the anomaly, you know, going home for maybe two or three hours and coming back. And, and when he, when Eric finally shows up, he must have had a hundred nasty grams from me on his computer. He comes rushing in. And first thing I said to him was when the going gets tough, the tough go camping. <laughs> <laughs> And in the middle of all of this, my wife and I took off for a two-week tour of Turkey. So we come back, and one of the things we picked up while we were over there was they everywhere you go in, in Turkey, there are these glass 
eyes and their protection against the evil eye. And so I made sure to bring back two big ones, and we hung one down in the in the control room in um, Redondo Beach, and we shipped another one up for the for the flight control deck in uh, at Ames, just to make sure we had something looking over our shoulder for the rest of the flight. Almost like the Eye of Mordor watching you at all times. <laughs> the, good, the good kind. Not quite as scary, but yeah. <laughs> I see you. Uh, so, so, I mean, the point I was making earlier was you guys are kind of a small group, and you kind of went into it uh, a little bit on your own, but uh, I was wondering what some of your best pranks were, and, and you got into a few of them, but what would you, because I have to believe you guys are pranking each other and just having a fun time with this, right? Because you're a skunk work project. It's, it's, it's a, you know, let's just make this thing go. It's a, it's a tighter knit team. Uh, all of the things you can talk about on the air, that's, uh, you know, because you've got the what happens on Elcross stays on Elcross rule, I'm sure. Statute uh, of limitations. Or, or what happens on Elcross crashes on the moon with Elcross. Uh, uh, what would be your favorite all-time prank during the uh, Elcross mission that you can talk about? Yeah, uh, you have to think about that one. Yeah. I'm sorry, I blew my, my, first one, my personal favorite was the bacon. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's just pestering. Yeah, I, 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 I ran a launch team, and, and for the most part, we actually pretty much stayed on track compared to some of the other projects I've worked where we went down to Florida. Um, we had one guy one time that fell asleep while we were waiting, and we hoisted him up with a crane. But um, that was <laughs> about the... Why did you say that so matter-of-factly? And then we just hoisted him up with a crane. <laughs> Go back a minute. Explain how that came to be. Well, there was there's um up on the launch pads uh, there are a variety of cranes and other uh, lift devices, and so most of them up there are air operated because you don't want to have anything that makes sparks around rocket fuel or anything like that exploding solid rocket motors. And one of the guys, this is not on Elcross, but prior to this, one of the guys um, we were up there one time waiting for somebody to come in and install some uh, some pads, some bridges, so that we could climb over onto the spacecraft and do some work. And we weren't allowed to do that because that was owned by the launch vehicle people. So we, we would go up there, and sometimes we'd have to sit around for an hour or two waiting for them to show up. Well, we were up there one day, and one of the guys lay down on the, uh, the soft cover that we had when we pulled over the spacecraft when it rained because the, uh, the white room leaks in the rain and you can't have your spacecraft getting wet so he laid out on this padded cover and he's he fell asleep so we just kind of took one of the air cranes and eased it down very quietly and hooked it onto the straps on his suit and then real quick cranked it up in the air and he woke up pretty quick oh <laughs> my goodness those KSC crazy guys um let's pop over to uh the other coast and talk to emery for a moment emery uh, how about you were there any fun moments uh even between hardware and software where you're like hey, i'm gonna flip the let's flip the spacecraft around that'll give those guys a jolt or any, <laughs> any moments? <laughs> let's make it go backwards <laughs> uh, <laughs> any moments well, they did, well they did throw we did a lot of training uh for flight operations you, you do a lot of training uh they throw a lot of anomalies at you so the uh the anomaly guys who were figuring out uh, what kind of anomalies that we needed to test with? Uh, they would uh, because I because I wrote the software that that you know talks to the spacecraft and knows how to you know get the commands up and the telemetry down and all that kind of stuff. They would actually call me on the sly and say, "How do I simulate this?" So I would kind of know what some of the anomalies were because I helped them figure out how to simulate the anomaly, and uh, so that that was kind of fun. Um, I did get a uh, a green card at one point. One of the one of the tests uh, that we were doing, um, a, a card, this little card meant that I I had just be, been declared an anomaly. Uh, that's actually up on my uh, my Elcross blog. Uh, that's up on Facebook. And uh, so there's a picture of the card, and it says that I've been declared an anomaly, and I had to evacuate the building and, uh, on very very little notice. And so somebody over in the West Coast then had to take over the software thing. Uh, the anomaly card was kind of funny. Oh, was it? Was it? Was it a chemical a, spill? A chemical, chemical spill. spill. Yeah, it was a chemical. I was a I was a victim of a chemical spill. <laughs> yeah, that so uh, that was kind of fun. Um, one of the, my favorite things uh, that I remember, we had a, we did a lot of stuff with just regular audio telecons. Uh, we did a lot of our training that way. We had call-ins just constantly uh, before we even got the voice loops up. Uh, we did a lot of our a lot of means just you know just regular telecons, and uh, a lot of the telecons. Um, the, the Northrop Grumman telecons, those guys would always set the telecons up so that 
it always asks you your name, but it doesn't actually announce who you are. So it says, you know, please say your name and then press the pound sign. And you'd say whatever and press the pound sign, and it never played that audio back. But the NASA guys would always set up uh, the thing so that the whatever name that you put in would get announced. And uh, Eric Drucker, who was one of our other systems engineers, he would always say, I think probably like um, the name of the music artist that he happened to be listening to at the time. So you'd be, you know, be waiting for this telecon and it says Emory Stagmore has joined the conference. And all of a sudden it would say, you know, Jimi Hendrix has joined the conference. You know, <laughs> it was very strange. <laughs> now what's worse, whenever you hung up, it said, Jimi Hendrix is now leaving the conference. And at that point, you usually had about three or four VPs and NASA <laughs> higher ups. And uh, uh, as much fun as that was, it was uh, a little embarrassing at times. <laughs> One of my favorite things, and you really had to be there, was um, uh, Eric um, wasn't comfortable in the chair. So he would stand up at his console a lot, and he'd get kind of bored and start fidgeting. And he'd be like be doing the Eric dance, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it's really hard to describe, but I don't think I could do it without hurting myself. He ended up having to have back surgery, <laughs> but not because of Elcross. Not because of Elcross. <laughs> but um, yeah, he was, you know, and 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 we had uh, we were sharing video all the time. So the NASA guys had webcams on us. We had webcams on the NASA guys, and you would hear like the the head of NASA, Ames, walking in there and kind of cracking up at Eric, you know, dancing behind his uh, behind his console. <laughs> Oh, man. I, I wish that happened on. I wish that happened on Impact Day as well, because we're you know we're all watching the control room, uh, you know, with you guys in it. I, I would have loved to just see this little this little dance going on in the background. That would have been awesome. <laughs> uh, let's go back to Emory for just a moment. Emory, on uh, a more serious note, what, what was your favorite part of El Cross? Uh, what, what's your favorite takeaway from the entire mission? Um. Boy, I don't know. I, uh, probably. Um, Probably, geez, I don't know. I, I had my family there for both uh, launch and impact, um, so uh, that was really pretty special. Um, the the impact was was pretty amazing. Uh, we had had such uh, incredible media coverage, uh, both positive and negative. Some of it was pretty zany, and some of it was was a lot of fun. Uh, but I mean, it was just the amount of coverage was really a great thing. So it was just really great to be able to share that with uh, with so many people. Um, it's obviously opened a lot of doors for me because I've been on uh, Space Vidcast now what four times I think, and uh, you know it's it's just put me in contact with a lot of people, and it's uh, one of the most memorable experiences of my life. Um, I keep telling people that two of my goals in life are to play music with musicians who are better than I am and to work with engineers who are smarter than me. And uh, I worked with an awful lot of people who were smarter than me. Uh, these three guys and, and other other coast here in the room, uh, you guys are really great to work with. Uh, let's pop back to the other coast. And before I ask you the same question, the chat room did want to want me to ask you really quickly. Um, did you guys see the high five fail in the uh, uh, in the? <laughs> yes, we that did. Was, uh, that was hilarious. <laughs> they just wanted to know: a) who was that, and b) what did you think of that? Well, I don't. I don't think Not we can true. give you names, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was more of an accident than uh, um, on purpose. But well, very much an accident. It, the guy who, who snubbed was uh, was needed in the mission ops room immediately, and had to had to book out of there. He was he was focused on only only getting to the other room. But he was. was um, he actually uh, has a really nice, very detailed write up. Science and Impact Day. Uh, his name is Mark Shirley, and on uh, Paul Tompkins' L Cross Flight Director's blog at, at blogs.nasa.gov. Awesome. That that was uh, it was a good just from a consumer standpoint. That was just a good. They're human too. See, see the rocket scientists. They're human too. All right. Um, <laughs> we we thoroughly enjoyed the the the, the um, uh, Saturday Night Live version of the myth. I was just dying. <laughs> Um, what was your favorite moment of the El Cross mission, uh, uh, West Coast? What, what did you? What was your big takeaway from this particular mission? Um, mine personally, um, I, I had my son sitting next to me, on console with me, texting Emery. He might not have known who was texting him at the time, but um, that was just fantastic to, to have my uh, my uh, son next to me and, and experience that with me right on console. 
and um, and he was on stage with the rest of us when in front of all the news cameras and uh, everything. So uh, you have you seen it? You know, you don't get to do things like that with your family very often. You know, share that 15 seconds of fame. Right? Um, for me, it 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 goes a long ways back when. Um, when I was young, about 10 years old, my dad applied for the astronaut program and got turned down because he didn't have enough test pilot flight hours at the time. And uh, when I was, gosh, I guess about 12, 11, something like that, when Apollo 7 reentered, he got me and my brother up very early in the morning and we walked outside to the ball field across from our house in Navy Housing in Albany, Georgia, and watched Apollo 7 reenter and all lit up by the sky. By the, by the sun as it was coming in and watching the service module come in behind it and blow up and the, and the, the command module the astronauts re enter. And he and I would always share stories about the space program and, and we got close to the launch. We had a chance to engrave some names on the vehicle. Um, and I put my dad and my mom up there along with my wife and myself because of the fact that Karen put up with me being working so hard and being gone so much. And my mother and my father were very important. My mom, a friend of hers, got me into the business and and my dad was the one that got me interested in the first place. And he he died about seven months after the launch, but he had a chance to be down there at the launch, and he had a chance to see the impact um, on the on the net live. And uh, we had a chance to tell my, my my sister saw it first and told my mom when the when the news report was coming on ABC News about it. So he had a chance to see that, and that for me was was the high point of it. I mean, this was. This is incredibly fun, but it's very personal as well. That's very cool. And finally? Yeah, mine was very much like Jose's. My uh, uh, Growing up in the early 60s, I always wanted to get to the moon or uh, uh, be involved in the space program. And this, uh, I can't tell you the rich feeling it was to have my name on those plates sitting up on the moon right now granted unrecognizable, but um, I also got to put my family's names and my father and mother's names on, and my father uh, passed away in February of 2009. He did not get to see the launch, but at least he knew that it was headed. So. One of the things that we, we've joked about with the, with the folks from NASA before is that someday in the far future, uh, if some alien civilization finds the first artifact of humans, those beat up nameplates engraved on the surface of the moon, what the heck are they going to try and figure out from that as a Rosetta Stone? All they leave behind is their trash. What is all this? <laughs> trash and graffiti. All right, guys, that is our show. Now, before we go, I did want to I did want to congratulate you. You recently won the Popular Mechanics uh, 2010 uh, what is it? Breakthrough, Breakthrough Award. Award for, for Innovation, Innovation in Science and Technology. What she just said. Uh, and that's that's really cool. And you've won the Space Vidcast Award for being awesome. So that's an official <laughs> award, just so you know. It's a water bottle, it's actually. A, from, uh, it looks <laughs> like this. Here you go. This is, the, this is the award right here. <laughs> hey, it's more than I got from Popular Mechanics, okay? <laughs> yeah. Hey, we got the perfect thing to put it in, too. Right, I don't know. I, was, I don't know if you realize it, but uh, while we were sitting in the Mission Ops room, we decided that we needed some uh, beverage uh, holders. So uh, we'll see if we can't get you one of the official. I think you guys need some of these. Anatomically, oh, yeah. I think we need some of those too. Beverage koozies. It's got. Uh, they were only panels. used for soda originally while yep. we were on console. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Let's see if we can get one out your way. You know these. This particular mission was cool because it did have a lot of media coverage, and it was one of those things that um, started getting the. Uh, outside of the crazy stuff, because there was a little crazy that happened Astrology too. Astrology is still intact. <laughs> hey, and uh, the star people, we never found any DNA traces in the signatures, at least not that they're telling us. Ooh, thank goodness. <laughs> cover up. It's a cover up. Conspiracy. Um, <laughs> oh, but sorry, I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> um, did destroy that, uh, that uh, hidden moon base, though. <laughs> in spite of these psych psychic friends trying to uh, protect it. Well, that's why you went up there in the first place, right? We weren't looking for water. We had to destroy the hidden moon base, and we were also trying to change the orb. I've heard this one, too. Change I the didn't... orbit of the moon. Yes, but no, no, no. <laughs> uh, don't yeah. want the X Division looking into any of this stuff. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I did want to congratulate you guys. You guys did um, bring science and make it interesting to a lot of people who maybe 
had forgotten and you know a lot of people are passionate about this stuff and you did you made it fun and there was a little bit of a debate there but you know what it was fun and it got people interested and you made mainstream media large national television and that was awesome I wish more space programs were able to do that so please don't go anywhere if you guys have a few more minutes I've got a few more questions uh, involving uh, one of them abbreviating your names in the near in mid infrared about five seconds before impact on the camera so uh, stay with us. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ask you that question in a moment. For everyone else, I'd like to thank you for watching live. If you're not watching live, for shame! You should watch live. It's way more fun live. You get to participate in the chat room and on the Twitters, and you can ask your questions live with the guest. It's way more awesome that way. Uh, we will actually, now that I've just told you you should watch live, we will not be live next week because uh, the three of us, calf right there, there you go. Uh, we'll be in Las Vegas for the Blog World Expo. And if you're going to be down in the Las Vegas area, Carrie Ann and I show up Thursday. Kath, when do you show up? Friday? Thursday? Friday morning. So Thursday, Friday, if you'd like to meet any of us, we'd love to meet you guys at uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, so no show next week. And um, we got to start telling you now, because otherwise you're going to start complaining. Uh, Space Vid Cast does not honor daylight savings time. We do our show at uh, 0, 0200 hours, coordinated universal time. If you change your clocks twice a year, if you roll your clock forward and backward for daylight savings time, the time of the show will be changing in the first week in November. So in a little less than a month, or about almost exactly a month, the show time for you will most likely be one hour earlier than normal. If you do not change your clocks, because this boggles people's minds, not all areas of the world actually honor daylight savings times. By the way, not all areas of the U.S. honor daylight savings time. If you do not change your clocks, the show time does not change for you and will remain at exactly the same time that you've got it now. Now watch our website. There's a live countdown on the website that will count down to the exact time of the show and will continue to remind you for the remainder of the shows up until the daylight savings time change. I'd like to thank you all for watching us. Stay with us. Post show is next. In 1969, the astronauts changed. They walked, they walked, they walked, they walked. In 1970, our journey, 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 our journey,